The Happiness Industry by William Davies. This is chapter three. In the mood to buy. A sheet of metal with two square holes cut into it lies on a, to- a tabletop with a piece of rope attached to it. At the end of the rope, dangling from the table, there is an iron weight. At a given moment, a lever will be pulled, releasing the sheet of metal, which is then pulled violently across the tabletop by the weight. As it moves, the square holes quickly pass over an image drawn on the tabletop below, revealing it to an observer for a split second, and then concealing it again. The observer calculates precisely how long the image was revealed, and makes a record of what impression, if any, it made on the eye. This is how tachistoscopes worked in Germany in the 1850s. At the time, they were used by physiologists researching human vision. Optical research examined various aspects of seeing, including light, depth, perception, after images, and how a pair of eyes constructed the image in three dimensions. The eye was to be probed and tested in search of different responses. Today's equivalent of a tachistoscope can operate relatively cheaply via an ordinary computer webcam. The movement of the eye can be tracked as can the dilation of the pupil. The length of time that the eye settles on a particular image or part of an image can be timed to the nearest millisecond. Private companies with names like Effectiva and Realize deliver commercial services to clients wanting to know how to win and keep the attention of their audiences. These techniques often operate within more extensive face scanning programs, which promise to unlock the secrets of our emotional states. Face scanning technology is spreading into everyday situations, such as supermarkets and bus stops, to help tailor messages appropriately for individuals. Of course, these 21st century tachistoscopes are not being employed for purely scientific purposes. More often than not, eye tracking of this sort is done in the service of market research and targeted advertising. Since the late 1990s, market researchers have become increasingly fixated upon our eyes and faces for telltale signs of what we might buy. Underlying this has been a growing belief that consumption is driven primarily by emotions. A 1994 book by the Portuguese-American neuroscientist Antonio Damasio, entitled Descartes' Error, exerted a profound influence across the advertising and market research industries. On the basis of brain scans, Damasio argued that rationality and emotion are not alternative or opposing functions of the brain, but on the contrary, that emotions are a condition of behaving in a rational way. For example, individuals who'd suffered brain damage hampering their emotional capacities were also discovered to be incapable of taking more calculated, rational decisions. Damasio is now spoken of in hushed tones as the forefather of a mini-enlightenment in marketing theory and science. Gradually at first, but gaining momentum with the arrival of Malcolm Gladwell's 2005 book, Blink, Every leading advertising and market research guru has come to view the emotional aspects of the mind and brain as the target for their ad campaigns and research. This has yielded such dubious legacies as neuromarketing and scent logos. Psychologists such as Jonathan Haidt push this further to analyze the emotional, emotional underpinnings of moral and political choices. In a way, this sounds a little surprising. We have long known that advertisers target our unconscious desires and insecurities in their efforts to get us to buy their products. It was in 1957 that the hidden persuaders first claimed to pull back the curtain and reveal the manipulations and tricks that the ad men were practicing on us. In 
Perhaps it's just that advertising theory is unusually fad-based. And emotions are back in again right now, but will soon be usurped by another concept. There is also the fact that advertisers have long resisted the portrayal of them as hidden persuaders, insisting that it is impossible to get something to buy something, or get someone to buy something he doesn't really want. What's new? To many market researchers, the dawn of neuroscience has fundamentally changed things. According to the more optimistic among them, scientists are close to discovering the brain's buy button, that specific area of mushy gray matter that triggers us to put an item in our shopping basket. The neuroscience of emotions potentially means that advertisers are no longer faced with a choice between thinking creatively and thinking scientifically. They can identify what forms of image, sound, and smell produce emotional attachments to specific brands. Add, to th add this to advances in the computerized coding of eye movement and facial muscles, and you have the apparatus to really know what people are feeling. Some are using hormonal testing to add to the mix. So much technological progress has led to a surge of scientific exuberance in the market research community. Discovering whether or not an, advertising, an advertisement actually works in targeting a specific emotion and with it the propensity to buy something is now a real possibility. An objective quantitative science of desire seems feasible. Various new findings are emerging as a result. The South African advertising guru Eric Duplessis has convinced many businesses, most crucially Facebook, that whether or not we like something exerts the greatest emotional influence over what we will then do. Another study has shown that fear is what drives people to buy products from big name brands. Brian Knutson, a Stanford neuroscientist, has discovered that most of the pleasure associated with buying something occurs during the anticipation of receiving it and has advised companies to structure their sales practices accordingly. Ways of reducing the pain of the price tag, such as minimizing the number of syllables in the price when spoken, are also explored. The psychological pain of spending money is seduced or is reduced when the customer uses a credit card than when they pay with cash. Positive psychologists and happiness economists make a great play of the fact that many, uh, that money and material possessions don't lead to an increase in our mental well-being. But these experts are in a minority compared to the vast assemblage of consumer psychologists, consumer neuroscientists, and market researchers all dedicated to ensuring that we do achieve some degree of emotional satisfaction by spending money. Less and less about our shopping habits is being left to chance. Advertisers will stay, will still swear that the hidden persuader's image of them is inaccurate and unfair. After all, the emotions being targeted, generated, and researched are not fake in any way. This is not about lying to people. On the contrary, emotion has become the market research industry's preferred version of happiness or pleasure as they existed for Bentham and his followers. It is the solid neural, chemical, or psychological reality which underpins everything else that we experience or think is going on. Most importantly, it is what leads us to get our credit cards out of our pockets. But in a way that Jevons might have respected, we don't do so under the influence of lies or advertising ideology, but because we really will receive a quantity of positive feelings as a result. That, at least, is the claim. As market research becomes increasingly swept up in this scientific exuberance, a number of questions are going un unanswered. What precisely is an emotion anyway? It is all very well saying that it is a visible occurrence in the brain, but that doesn't help us understand what we mean by the term, or by specific words such as anxiety, joy, fear, happiness, hate, like, and so on. It is difficult to imagine how one would explain or describe these occurrences to someone 
who had never experienced them, no matter how good one's instruments of detection were. Furthermore, it is deeply unclear within this new neuro-industrial complex where precisely agency lies. Are consumers considered to be sovereign, autonomous beings whose emotions are constitutive of their free will and personality? Or are they passive vessels who get emotionally buffeted by the images, sounds, and smells that come before them? Marketers would hesitate to declare the latter, and yet their methods are scarcely compatible with the former view either. Maybe they don't really know. Accrediting decision-making to the brain is the preferred way of ducking this philosophical dilemma. While the scanning technology that promises to unlock the secrets of our feelings is dazzling, dazzlingly new, the philosophical and ethical questions that result from it are quite old. This points us to a recurring pattern within psychological research that dates back to those first optical tachistoscopes of the 1850s, and it concerns the mesmerizing lure of mind-reading technologies. With every wave of new methods and instruments for scanning the thought processes of sensations of others, so there occurs a resultant belief that hard science has ousted philosophy and ethics once and for all. At the same time, there is always the hope that it is possible to understand another human being without talking to them. But on each occasion, there is still some residual visual of the of what or some residual vision of what freedom and consciousness really mean that escapes scientific validation. When psychologists, neuroscientists, or market researchers claim to have liberated their dis discipline from moral or philosophical considerations once and for all, the question has to be posed. So where do you get your understanding of humanity from? Including its various, oops, its various emotional states, drives, and moods. From your own intuition, and what feeds that? In the years since those first tachistoscopes were introduced, the answer has become increasingly plain. The residual notion of freedom that structures how this science progresses is the freedom to shop. If that is the case, then contemporary neuromarketing and facial coding might rightly be accused of being a circular venture. What they discover in the synapses of our brains and the flickering of our eyes is not raw data to be injected afresh into advertising designs, but is unavoidably interpreted through a consumerist philosophy. Therefore, we need to examine the history of psychology and the history of consumerism as intertwined projects. Technology is absolutely integral to this entanglement. It is thanks to technical methods and instruments from the tachistoscope onwards that psychology can claim to be its own objective science in the first place. The seductive power of such instruments has allowed certain individuals to declare that philosophy and ethics are no longer needed. It is here that much of the Benthamite promise of a scientific politics has been channeled, a politics in which hard expertise or the feelings of others replaces the messiness and ambiguity of dialogue. But behind this version is not national government in pursuit of a public interest, rather a corporation in pursuit of, of a private one, between philosophy and the body. In 1879, a former physiologist and occasional philosopher named Wilhelm Wundt declared that a certain part of his office at Leipzig University had become off-limits. Henceforth, it would be used for carrying out experiments, not unlike the ones he'd helped arrange when working as an assistant to the great German physicist Hermann von Helmholtz in Heidelberg during the 1860s. He'd also practiced physiological experiments on human muscles while training to be a doctor. Wundt was never short of self-confidence, and at one point promised to reveal the truth of muscular reflex once and for all. But Wundt also had philosophical ambitions, which he didn't intend to relinquish entirely for the sake of the natural sciences. In 
He was convinced that while mental processes could occur spontaneously, they also occurred at a certain speed, which could in principle be measured. The purpose of his new experimental space was to explore such philosophical questions using techniques and instruments that he picked up from the physical sciences. Human subjects would be used just as they had been when he was testing muscular responses. That sealed off area of once office is now recognized as the world's first ever psychology laboratory. The physical delin delineation of the laboratory was highly symbolic, resulting in a disciplinary separation of psychology from the areas of theory and science on which it had previously been dependent. Forms of psychological research had been conducted across Europe since the early 19th century, often including elements of experimentation, as exemplified by Fechner's weightlifting. But these were conducted from within physiological and or philosophical traditions of inquiry and were typically carried out by researchers upon themselves, meaning they relied on introspection for their data. Once achievement was to distinguish psychology as a discipline of its own, potentially separate from both physio physiology and philosophy. In doing this, he made a statement with profound and far-reaching implications for how we understand ourselves and others. What Wundt effectively implied was that the psyche hovers in its own specific domain between the realm of natural biology and that of physical or philosophical ideas. Bentham had established a sharp binary opposition between the matters of reality, for which, for which read natural science, for which read natural science, and those of nonsensical fiction, for which read met metaphysics. Wundt was adding a third option, a form of reality which we can acquire knowledge of but isn't reducible to the laws of nature. This includes the various categories that we recognize as psychological today, mood, attitude, morale, personality, personality, emotion, intelligence, and so on. How could these apparently intangible conceptual entities become an object of scientific investigation? Wundt was keen to avoid resorting to introspection of the sort that many English psychologists had used during the 1850s and 1860s. The purpose of the laboratory was to study mental processes in a more objective fashion than that. He and his, his assistants built various tools to test the response of experimental subjects to different stimuli. They also borrowed various instruments from physiology and physics labs to time neural reflexes, and they built their own version of a tachistoscope, which was used to time how long it took to get a person's attention. The eyes were a crucial area of study for the pioneering psychologists, but not merely in a physiological sense. Now they provided a glimpse of thinking itself. Much of what went on in Wundt's lab would have appeared very similar to what was going on in physiological experiments on the body. Pulse rate and blood pressure were among the measurable indicators of inner emotional states. One of the key differences which also distinguishes this early psychological research from what would come later was that the subjects being experimented on were scholarly associates and students of Wundt. They were fully aware they were fully aware of what the experiments were seeking to test and contributed their own subjective insights to the findings. The perspective of the experimental subject was important here, and there was no sense in which they were being manipulated. Conscious thought processes needed to be respected in their own right and not reduced to naturalistic questions of cause and effect. For instance, the speed of conscious reaction when the subject became aware of something could be compared to the speed of unconscious reaction when the physical reflex occurred. Once challenge was to avoid collapsing his research back into physiology, but also to avoid idle, untestable philosophical speculation.
In truth, he was combining an element of both in the hope of achieving more than the sum of those two parts. As the aesthetic theorist Jonathan Crary has argued, once focus upon the eyes and attention was indicative of a profound philosophical shift that was underway during the late 19th century. The conditions of subjective experience, which had been matters of philosophical speculation since the 17th century, were gradually being rendered bodily and therefore visible to the expert eye. Wundt did not dispense with the philosophical notion of consciousness, but he was happy to elide it with that of field of vision. In doing so, the shift from a conceptual language to a scientific one was accelerated. The capacity to experience the outside world was no longer something God-given, lying invisibly within all human beings, but a function of the human body. As such, it could be seen, tested, known, and influenced. Despite the symbolic separation of the psychology lab from his office, Wundt himself never achieved an entirely clear delineation of psychological research. In Germany, psychology remained closely associated with philosophy right up until the First World War. In the early 20th century, in the final years of his career, Wundt drifted back into philosophy, but also into the terrain of sociology. Zigzagging his way between methods he'd picked up from physical research and metaphysical questions of consciousness, Wundt nevertheless produced some important psychological theories. He identified three different measurable ways in which the emotions can vary. Pleasure, displeasure, tension, composure, excitement, composure. This may sound crude, but already the contrast between the mental insights of psychology and those of economics was becoming pronounced. According to Wundt, our instinctive emotional responses to things are critical in determining the choices we make. Human beings are far more complicated than mere calculators of pleasure, and the dawn of psychological experimentation revealed how. In extending experimental instruments beyond the study of the human body and into terrain previously dominated by philosophers, once place in history was guaranteed. Many philosophers and economists merely fantasized about instruments capable of measuring thought, but Wundt actually built and used them. The path he carved between physiology and philosophy was only possible thanks to this new equipment and the authority he claimed for himself in applying it to the study of other minds. Today, neuroscience might appear to be bringing the Wundt project to a close. We no longer need to access the mind via the eyes or any other part of the body, but believe we can go direct to the brain. The very idea of the mind as a knowable yet immaterial entity is, as a result, in question. Yet there is also an underlying intellectual honesty in Wundt's approach. He never claimed to be escaping profound philosophical dilemmas. The mind was not reducible to the body, but nor was it entirely separate from it either. Thinking and consciousness exert their own influence over how we act and the symptoms our bodies display. Our free will is not an illusion. For this reason, Wundt refused to purge psychology of philosophical language, much to the chagrin of one particular group of his students. Migrating Methods Wundt's lab turned him into an academic celebrity. It made him an object of fascination for visitors to Leipzig, and an appealing patron for ambitious young scholars. Numerous graduate students flocked to work with Wundt, and he oversaw the completion of an astonishing 187 doctoral research projects over the course of his career. Over the 1880s and 1890s, Leipzig was the focal point for anyone interested in the emerging discipline of experimental psychology. These scientific developments in Germany coincided with the most transformative period in American history. Between 1860 and 1890, the population of the United States trebled due to an influx of immigrants largely into cities. The end of the Civil War saw a large population of African Americans migrate from the former slave states to the rapidly industrializing cities of the Northeast and Midwest. 
Coinciding with this was an unprecedented wave of business mergers, leading to the creation of what we now recognize as the modern corporation. This in turn required that a new cadre of professional managers be produced to oversee these huge enterprises. In a relatively short space of time, America went from being a largely agrarian economy of Anglo-Saxon small landowners, still romanticized by many conservatives today, to being an urban industrial economy driven by large professionally managed businesses, which sucked in labor from impoverished parts of Europe at great speed. The identity crisis this caused in a society that had been founded on the basis of local democratic participation among landowners and slave owners was profound. A further development during this period was the foundation of a number of new American universities, including Cornell, Chicago, and Johns, Hops Johns Hopkins. Right from the beginning, many of these institutions had close relationships with the business world, which became closer still as the century, century wore on and the wealth and benefaction of corporations increased. To support the emerging managerial class, the world's first business school, Wharton, Pennsylvania, was established in 1881, with the scale of domestic markets growing. Thanks to the spread of railroads across the United States, businesses were increasingly hungry for knowledge they could use, especially regarding consumers. Some crude market research techniques were in existence by the 1860s, including newspaper straw polls, and primitive survey techniques, plus a few advertising agencies had already been established. There were even some basic theories of consumer behavior, borrowed largely from economics, but this was all clumsy stuff. Who would teach in all of these new universities? Where would they acquire their expertise? German universities were also growing rapidly during this period and offered a crucial source of scientific training for a new generation of American scholars. Between the middle of the 19th century and the First World War, 50,000 Americans traveled to Germany and Austria to undertake university degrees and research training to bring back to the United States. This represents one of the biggest exports of intellectual capital in history, especially in areas such as chemistry, physiology, and the new field of psychology. Among this number was a collection of relatively junior American psychologists eager to discover more about the celebrated goings on in once laboratory. They included William James, the godfather of American psychology and brother of the novelist Henry, Walter Dill Scott and Har Harlow Gale, the first psychological theorists of advertising, James McKean Cattell, who went on to become an influential figure in New York's Madison Avenue advertising industry, and G. Stanley Hall, leader founder of the American Journal of Psychology, who bequeathed us the term morale. The period spent by these Americans in Germany was not an altogether happy one. William James had initially struck up a long distance relationship with Wundt, but on arrival in Leipzig became increasingly contemptuous of Wundt's continuing metaphysical language, which he deemed unscientific and mystical. Hall was even more horrified by all of the philosophical jargon and soon dropped out to return home. There's some indication that the low level animosity between the visitors and their host was mutual. Want complained that the Americans were basically economists who assumed that human beings were slaves to external incentives and not actually possessing free will at all. He described McKean Cattell as typically American, which was not intended as a compliment. What did impress James and his cohort, however, was the technology that Wundt had assembled. They looked in awe at the finely tuned tachistoscopes and other timing devices which Wundt put to work in his laboratory. They studied the physical layout of the lab itself and drew careful diagrams of its arrangement. Much of the intellectual narrative accompanying these instruments was left well alone, but the devices and spaces were an inspiration. Much of it was copied directly once the American visitors returned home. Indeed, the first psychology labs at Harvard, Cornell, Chicago, Clark, Berkeley, and Stanford 
all clearly betrayed the influence of want. In addition to copying the floor plan and many of the instruments, they even tempted some of Wundt's students across the Atlantic. James persuaded Hugo Munsterberg to migrate to the United States, where he established the first psychology lab at Harvard, and went on to become a prominent figure in the field of industrial psychology. What do they want, these English psychologists? Frederick Nietzsche had mused in his 1887 work, The Genealogy of Morals. The question was intended for the Benthamites and Darwinists of his day, such as Sully, Jevons, and Edgeworth. Why were they so obsessed with understanding fluctuations in pleasure? If the same question had been put to their American contemporaries, as they feverishly hunted down new methods and designs to bring back from Germany, the answer would have been much easier to divine. Crudely put, they wanted to provide a set of tools for managers. American psychology had no philosophical heritage. It was born into a world of big business and rapid social change, which risked spiraling out of control. If it couldn't offer to alleviate the problems that were afflicting American industry and society, then it had no reason to exist at all. That, at any rate, was this view expressed by leaders, or was the view expressed by leaders of the new League of Universities, who were eager to please their corporate benefactors. In the early 20th century, psychology made an explicit pitch to act as the master science through which the American dream might yet be rescued. If individual decision-making itself could be reduced to a hard science with quasi-natural laws and statistics, that it might still be possible for a multinational, multi-ethnic, industrial, mass society to function while still upholding the core enlightenment principle of liberty on which the Republic had been founded. The journey time between the founding of American psychology and its application to business problems was extremely short. If we date modern psychology back to that moment in 1879 when Wundt drew a symbolic line around his laboratory, it was only another 20 years before the field of consumer psychology emerged. By 1900, James McKean Cattell and Harlow Gale had returned from Leipzig and were carrying out their own experiments with tachistoscopes, specifically to understand how individuals responded to different advertisements. Using once tools, they hoped to understand not only consumer reactions to different advertisements, but also their emotions. Publishing in 1903 and 1908, respectively, Walter Dill Scott produced the first two classic works of advertising theory, the theory of advertising and the psychology of advertising. Cattell later established the Psychological Corporation, a business consultancy tailoring academic research for clients after he was dismissed from Columbia University in 1917 due to his opposition to the draft. None of this would have been possible without Wundt, but these former students were less than loyal to his legacy. With the entry of America into the First World War, anti-German sentiment saw many American psychologists attempt to scrub the Leipzig chapter from their history. They believed that they had put Wundt and his metaphysics behind them, and the road ahead was purely scientific. It was never a coincidence that this was precisely what American business wanted to hear. Shortly before his death, William James expressed some regrets at quite how anti-philosophical American psychology had become. He worried that the mysteries and spontaneity of the mind risked being obscured by so much emphasis on observation and measurement, especially where it was in the service of business. But by that standard, things were about to get a whole lot worse. Is it possible to study and understand human beings without allowing abstract conce concepts such as the will or experience to enter one's assessment? Can they be understood without letting them speak for themselves? Clutching their various measurement devices and timing gauges, many of the first generation of American psychologists may have hoped that the answer to these questions was yes, but some ambivalence remained. They may have moved well away from their from either philosophy or introspection, but the objects of their study, such as attention and emotion, were still somewhat abstract and presumed something innately human.
there was still a more radical option that they hadn't considered. What if psychologists were to try and forget that they were studying human beings altogether? The invention of human behavior. In 1913, an animal psychologist named John B. Watson gave a lecture at Columbia University, which would serve as a manifesto for one of the most influential scientific traditions of the 20th century, behaviorism. Watson was making a clear pitch for it and his supremacy, not only within American psychology, but in the various areas of policy and management which it was seeking to shape. If psychology would follow the plan I suggest, the educator, the physician, the jurist, and the businessman could utilize our data in a practical way as soon as we are able experiment experimentally to obtain them. A more explicit offer of scholarly complicit com complicity with power is harder to imagine. Within two years of the Columbia Address, Watson had become president of the American Psychological Association. The remarkable thing is that by this stage, he had never even studied a single human being. If the purpose of American psychology was to take once methods and then get rid of all the metaphysical jargon, elevating a man whose only scientific experiments had been on white rats to the most prestigious position in the discipline was a stroke of genius. In the early 21st century, the term behavior is everywhere. Behavior change preoccupies policymakers in their efforts to combat obesity, environmental degradation, and civic disengagement. Health behaviors regarding nutrition and exercise allegedly hold the key to controlling spiraling healthcare budgets. Behavioral economics and behavioral finance indicate the ways in which people miscalculate the optimal use of their time and money as popularized in the best-selling Nudge, whose two authors advise presidents around the world. We are encouraged to learn tricks to alter our own behavior, or nudge ourselves, as some experts put it, to help us pursue more active, resilient lifestyles. In 2010, the British government opened a behavioral insights unit to bring such findings into policymaking. This unit has been so successful that in 2013, it was part privatized to enable it to offer commercial consultancy to governments around the world. In 2014, a $17 million gift from the Pershing Square Family Philanthropic Trust led to the launch of the Harvard Foundations of Human Behavior Initiative, aimed at pushing the science of behavior to the next level. Brain sciences occupy the current frontier of the investigation of what really leads us to behave as we do. Contained within each of these policy projects is a single ideal, that individual activity might be diverted towards goals selected by elite powers, but without either naked coercion or democratic, democratic deliberation. Behaviorism stretches Bentham's dream of a scientific politics to its limit imagining that beneath the illusion of individual freedom lie the cold mechanics of cause and effect, observable only to the expert eye. When we, when we put our faith in behavioral solutions, we withdraw it from democratic ones to an equal and opposite extent. Until the 1920s, however, the term behavior would have been scarcely associated with people at all. It would have made perfect sense to talk of the behavior of a plant or an animal. Doctors might have used the term to refer to the behavior of a particular body part or organ. This tells us something important about contemporary appeals to behavioral science. When this category is being invoked, there is no specific recognition that the behavior in question is displayed by a person, as opposed to anything else that reacts to stimuli. The, the behaviorist believes that observation can tell us everything we need to know while interpretation or understanding of actions or choices can be sidestepped altogether. This was exactly why Watson believed the concept held such huge promise for psychology, if it was serious about becoming a science. In 1917, by which point he had finally made the switch to the study of human subjects, he made his position brutally clear.
the reader will find no discussion of consciousness and no reference to such terms as sensation, perception, attention, will, image, and the like. These terms are in good repute, but I have found that I can get along without them both in carrying out investigations and in presenting psychology as a system to my students. I frankly do not know what they mean. This was not merely anti-philosophical, it was virtually anti-psychological, at least in the sense that we typically understand psychology. His rubbishing of abstract mental concepts, sensation perception, has strong echoes of Bentham. But Bentham didn't have a psychology lab and couldn't progress without a little speculation regarding the nature of human motives. Watson was calling his colleagues bluff. If you really want to be a proper science, cleansed of metaphysics, then you have to give up everything that can't, that can't be observed scientifically. The search for hard, objective reality of the psyche would now be the exclusive preserve of specialists with specialist equipment. Watson reveled in provocation. He declared that thinking was no less observable an activity than baseball, scoffing at the privilege that philosophers attach to subjective experience. He famously proclaimed that, since there was no such thing as personality or innate ability, he could take a child from any background and turn him into a successful businessman or sportsman, purely through conditioning. Humans were like white rats, which responded to their environment and whatever stimuli came their way. Our actions could not be scientifically attributed to us as free-thinking, autonomous persons. Rather, they could only be explained in terms of other aspects of our environment or previous environmental factors that have trained us to behave that way. There is something subtly seductive about this vision, which may account for its enduring popularity in spite of its technocratic ideal. Nudging has been criticized on grounds of paternalism, but of course paternalism can also be comforting. The sense that someone else is taking the important decisions, that we have been relieved of full responsibility for our actions, can come as a relief. To learn that I'm hardwired or conditioned to take certain decisions may represent a welcome break from the constant modern demand to exercise free will. If our actions are shaped by our environment, nature, or upbringing, at least we're part of some larger collective, even if, even if it is only visible to experts. The problem is that we have, that we often have little idea what those experts want. Watson's appearance on the academic stage prefigured a bonfire of metaphysical language. The science of behavior would either dominate all rival areas of scholarly expertise, such as sociology, management, public policy, or simply destroy them altogether, the fate intended for philosophy. Was this really intellectual progress of any sort? Only if the natural sciences are viewed as the sole model for sensible and honest debate. An implicit in Watson's agenda was an even greater reverence for the capabilities of technology than even his forebears had displayed following the return from Leipzig. What he was effectively promising was this. Using exceptional powers of experimentation, the psychological observer will reveal everything that can be known about human beings and all other claims, such as those made by the person being studied are entirely irrelevant. In that sense, behaviorism was only possible if the practice of psychology was refounded on a fundamental power imbalance between the status of the psychologist and that of the ordinary layperson. In Watson's hands, psychology would become a tool of expert manipulation. Wundt had assumed that it was more revealing to experiment on subjects who understood what was being tested. This was why he conducted experiments on his own students and associates. They could contribute informed insights to the research. Watson assumed the opposite, to discover how the human animal responded to different stimuli and might be reprogrammed to respond differently. It was far more revealing to use subjects who were entirely ignorant of what was being tested and how. This would also ensure that psychology could deliver on its promises of practical utility in the hands of marketers, policymakers, and managers.
If psychology were to help keep the sprawling, complex mass of American society under some sort of control, it was no use acquiring insights from studies that were only valid in relation to the behavior of other psychologists. For these reasons, behaviorism runs inevitably into problems of research ethics. It is not just that behavioral experiments seek to manipulate, they also work through a modicum of deception. Even where informed consent is used, the subjects must remain partly ignorant of exactly what is being tested, or else there is the fear that they might adjust their behavior accordingly. The goal is to minimize conscious understanding of what is going on. Nevertheless, if one can still be bothered to think this way, a familiar philosophical contradiction arises once more. Is the autonomous, critical, conscious mind really eliminated from the, from the psychological science? Within the behaviorist worldview, the general public are not unlike white rats, whose inner thought processes are effectively non-existent, until they become observable in some way. But the thoughts of the psychologist are far from irrelevant and are communicated via academic articles, lectures, books, policy reports, and conversations. Behaviorism only succeeds in eliminating all forms of theory or interpretation to the extent that it privileges the perspective of one single scientific discipline and profession and trashes all others. In that respect, the eradication of metaphysics can only succeed as a tangible political project in which the vast majority of people have no legitimate view, be it scientific or otherwise, to be taken into account. The buying animal. Behaviorism was ready-made for clients in the government and private sector. It didn't take much to help it spread to Madison Avenue and beyond, although the journey was accelerated by an event of professional disgrace. In the period after World War I, Watson was a highly celebrated academic at Johns Hopkins University, winning large research grants and pay raises. But in 1920, it emerged that he'd been having an affair with a young graduate student and assistant, Rosalie Rayner. Unfortunately for him, the Rayners were a revered Maryland family who had made generous donations to Johns Hopkins. News of the affair spread fast, making national newspapers, which even published a letter between Watson and Rayner. Given the somewhat nihilistic view of human nature that underpinned Watson's re research agenda, some observers could not help but make a connection. His colleague, Adolf Mayer, who would later exert a powerful influence over the American psychiatric profession, was of this view. I cannot help seeing in the whole matter a practical illustration of the lack of responsibility to have a definite philosophy, the implications of not recognizing meanings, the emphasis on the emancipation of science from ethics. Watson evidently had failed to avoid responding to the physical stimulus represented by Rosalind, or Rosalie Rayner, but behaviorism did not cut it as a defense. Johns Hopkins forced him out and he left Baltimore for New York. By 1920, the advertising industry was fully alert to the potential riches offered by psychology. At the forefront of this movement was Madison Avenue firm J. Walter Thompson, JWT, whose president at the time, Stanley Rezer, pledged to, re pledged to turn his business into a university of advertising. Scientific advertising was all the rage. Rezer was especially bullish about the emerging possibilities. Advertising, he argued, is educational work, mass education. The great advertising campaigns of the future would send messages directly to their passive recipients who would respond accordingly in their shopping habits. What this new university needed were the scientists to provide them with the data on how to do this. Rezer was specifically seeking someone who could advise them on the psychology of appeal believing that successful ads triggered that particular emotional response. Perhaps recognizing that he needed a scholar of flexible morals, he initially contacted another recently disgraced academic, William I. Thomas, who had been kicked out of the University of Chicago Sociology Department for his own extramarital affair. In 
Thomas viewed Thomas viewed Madison Avenue as too grubby a business, so he passed them on to Watson, a personal friend of his. Rezer had found his man. That same year, Watson joined JWT as an account ex executive on a salary four times what he was earning at John Hopkins. As part of the new position, he had to undergo some training, including traveling the backwaters of Tennessee, trying to sell coffee, and working several months behind the counter at Macy's in New York. With that out of the way, he was free to start applying his behaviorist doctrines to the design of advertising campaigns and advising his JWT colleagues on how to trigger the right responses. The most crucial thing for advertisers to remember, Watson implored his colleagues, was that they are not selling a product at all, but seeking to produce a psychological response. The product is simply a vehicle with which to do this, along with the advertising campaign. Consumers can be conditioned to do anything if the environmental factors are designed in the right way. Don't appeal to the consumer's existing emotions and desires, Watson urged, but trigger new ones. As part of a contract with Johnson & Johnson, he explored ways of marketing washing pow powder in terms of the emotions experienced by mothers, such as anxiety, fear, and the desire for purity. He is also credited with identifying celebrity endorsements as an effective route to achieving consumer attachments to brands. These were exactly the sort of messages and methods that Rezor was hoping to receive. In 1924, Watson was made a vice president of JWT. Looking down on Lexington Avenue from his office, from his office high up in JWT's headquarters near Grand Central Station, he had far outstripped the fame and fortune of any psychologist who had remained in the academy. But Watson's hubris was problematic. Business had bought into the notion that psychology could reveal everything that managers needed to know in order to sell their products effectively. Watson was content to stoke up this optimism further. <clears throat> Love, fear, and rage are the same in Italy, Abyssinia, and Canada, he bragged. He was confident that he knew how to trigger any emotion in any situation, purely through designing the stimulus in the right way. From the perspective of the advertiser and the marketer, this was a hugely seductive way of understating their task. But it was all one-way traffic. Psychological stimuli would be chuckled at the public, or would be chucked at the public, and they would respond accordingly in the supermarket aisles. What if they didn't? What if Watson's own understanding of love, fear, and rage wasn't the same as other people's? How would businesses find out? To complete the science of advertising, it was necessary that some form of feedback was also built into the system that would bring information back to the marketer. This could also be understood in behavioral terms, that is, whether a given ad directly prompted a certain response. For instance, discount coupons could be included in newspaper advertisements to be cut out and used to purchase the product in question. This feedback mechanism would allow the marketer to discover which ads stimulated the best response. Seventy years later, the rise of online advertising and e-commerce would make such behavioral analysis of marketing, of marketing effectiveness far more widespread. The response of the person viewing an ad is that much easier to assess in terms of click-throughs and purchases. In, 19, in the 1920s, the risk of Resser and Watson's scientific exuberance was that they overlooked what members of the public actually thought and felt. So confident were they that they could dictate emotional responses from scratch. Corporate America could not depend on this leap of faith alone. Behaviorism's radically scientific view of the mind suggested there was nothing to fear here. There was nothing lurking, hidden in the dark recesses of the mind that actually existed beyond what could be observed by psychologists. In fact, the very idea of the mind was just a philosophical distraction. The worry this generates is that a brand, or for that matter, a politician or ideology or policy, might have become unappealing in many, way, in, 
in ways that are apparent to the public, but not yet to scientists and elites. The science of desire also required discovering what people wanted, finding out what they hoped for, in addition to trying to shape it. Doing this required an unusual psychological technique that Watson had hoped to abandon. Speaking to people. <laughs> Glimpsing democracy. Watson could not help but notice that humans have a tendency to speak. He referred to this as verbal behavior. He was even prepared to accept that it could play a role in psychological research, though a deeply regrettable one. He ruefully reflected that we suffer in psychology today greatly because methods for observing what goes on in another individual's internal mechanisms in general are lacking. <laughs> this is the reason we have to depend in part at least upon his own report of what is taking place. We are gradually breaking away from this inexact method. We shall break away very rapidly when the need is more generally recognized. What, ben what Bentham called the tyranny of sounds frustrates the behaviorist as much as the utilitarian. Today, the facial coders, neuromarketers, and eye trackers are living Watson's dream of breaking away from subjective reports of experience and finding supposedly more objective routes to our internal states. Before behavioral psychology or market research achieved this breakaway feat, they found themselves in some quite unusual alliances. In the process, business came to understand people not only as passive recipients of corporate education or stimuli, but as active tentatively political actors with, with judgments about the world around them. If the task was to find out what people felt, wanted, or thought, Going out and asking them risked revealing some far more radical responses than JWT or Watson would have been prepared to countenance. What if they were sick of mass-produced goods? What if they didn't want lots more advertising? What if, above all, they wanted to say? As the craze, as the craze for psychological analysis swept American business over the course of the 1920s, Large foundations such as Rockefeller and Carnegie looked to fund cutting-edge forms of market research. Statist statisticians had just invented uh, randomized sampling methods, which greatly improved the authority of surveys as representations of large populations. Before sampling methods became available, surveys were very much skewed in terms of who happened to respond to them. They gave a flavor of opinion, but this couldn't claim to be typical. The foundations offered to fund researchers who would put the new sampling techniques to work in the service of better market intelligence on the part of U.S. corporations, but they were frustrated to to discover that most of the individuals or organizations capable of delivering this type of knowledge were political activists, socialists, and sociologists. Since social surveys had been conducted in Europe in the 1880s, they had tended to be carried out in pursuit of progressive political agendas. Charles Booth in East London, or W.E.B. Dubois in Philadelphia, set the stage for quantitative sociological research, which would go out and find how ordinary people lived by seeing them in their domestic environments and asking them questions. The techniques for doing this work became increasingly professionalized with the establishment of progressive institutions, such as the London School of Economics and the Brookings Institute in Washington, DC. As these statistical techniques of social research developed, they became a matter of public fascination in their own right. One of the studies funded by Rockefeller became a national obsession debated across the mainstream media. Conducted by a socialist husband and wife, Robert and Helen Lind, from 1924 onwards, the Middletown studies produced a series of best-selling publications. The research purported to hold up a, a mirror to American society, revealing banal yet fascinating details of the minutiae of how people went about their day-to-day -day lives. 
The researchers were hopeful that people would read these studies and challenge the culture of consumerism that was engulfing them. The Rockefeller Foundation believed that they were helping to identify new ways of connecting social values to corporate agendas. The Linz believed they were helping to raise class consciousness. At the intersection of the market and democratic socialism, the new survey techniques could serve either and both goals at the same time. Following a sequel 1937 study, Middletown in Transition, one sales journal announced that the only two books that are absolutely necessary for an advertising man are the Bible and Middletown. A new form of shared national self-consciousness had occurred and its political implications were entirely open-ended. These sorts of unlikely ideological alliances became a feature of how psychological surveys would advance over the course of the 1930s. The same techniques of inquiry moved seamlessly among market research departments, sociology, sociologist campaign or socialist campaigns, and the media. In one of the more extreme ideological balancing acts, the emigre Frankfurt School Marxist Theodore Adorno was hired to work on another Rockefeller funded research project to study CBS radio audiences, along with, along with the psychologists Hadley Cantrell, Paul Lazarsfeld, and a future president of CBS, Frank Stanton. Adorno had no immediate objection to the use of survey methods, which he saw as potentially emancipatory. He recognized that surveys had the capacity to challenge the dominance of the market as a form of collective expression, but he was quickly appalled by the more simplistic aspect of the research, in which individuals were invited to push buttons marked like and dislike when played different types of music. He left the project, which was soon redesigned to serve the needs of the CBS marketing department more closely. In Britain, market research was pioneered by a number of left-wing intellectuals and campaigners, including the philanthropist Joseph Roundtree and the Labour Party advisor Mark Abrams. Like the Linz, figures such as Abrams were openly critical of advertising and consumer culture, yet never gave up on the idea that market research could be used in a more noble fashion. With more objective knowledge of how people really lived, perhaps business might focus on serving real desires and needs and not manufacturing new ones. A British equivalent of the Middletown Studies, the Mass Observation Project was launched in 1937. In defiance of the behaviorist prejudice that humans are automatons to be programmed, these survey specialists had come to view individuals as the bearers of their own personal attitudes towards anything from Coca-Cola to the Catholic Church to the government. These attitudes were psychological phenomena that were amenable to quantification. As someone with an attitude, I am able to tell you how much I like a given product or institution on a scale of negative five to positive five. But crucially, in ways that defy the behaviorist prejudice, I alone am best placed to know what that attitude is and any scientist who wishes to know will have to ask me. Button pressing machines for the capturing of attitudes, like the worm that reveals how the audience feels during a presidential debate or the Facebook like button, cut out the use of speech from attitudinal research, but not the judgment of the attitude holder. This was the crypto-democratic underbelly of how market research developed as the Great Depression took hold and elites grew increasingly concerned as to what the masses had in mind. Understanding the attitudes of radio audiences, newspaper readers, and the voting public became big business over the course of the 1930s. It also became big politics. In 1929 and 1931, President Herbert Hoover commissioned surveys on social trends and consumer habits, partly in the hope of understanding what level of political unrest might be brewing. This variety of political knowledge soon became commercially available with the establishment of George Gallup's opinion polling company in 1935. When Gallup predicted the outcome of the 1936 presidential election with uncanny accuracy, the prestige of his techniques soared. President Franklin Roosevelt was a compulsive commissioner of polls from then on and hired Hadley Cantrell, formerly of the CBS Radio Research Project, as his in-house pollster.
anti-capitalism for sale. Once the judgment and voice of the ordinary person is admitted into market research, things can start to shift in a democratic direction. If you say so. This is an unpredictable end from the perspective of a corporation, government, or advertising account executive worrying situation. It contains the possibility that drove the Lins to, con to conduct the Middletown serv or studies or Abrams market research activities, namely that people may report a negative attitude towards consumerism or even towards capitalism itself. On the other hand, it is precisely the capacity to detect such threats that made these techniques indispensable for corporations and governments. Roosevelt may have conducted endless polls on how the public perceived his policies, but he never once altered a policy in response. Cantrell revealed that every commission for a new attitudinal study also included the requirement for advice on how the attitude might be corrected, for which read propaganda. Combine an effective survey technique with a ruthless behaviorist approach to advertising and you have a complete information loop. Messages go out to the public, individuals respond via behavior and surveys, and information then returns to the message sender. Each element of this has changed dramatically since the 1930s. The emphasis on mass society and the attitude of the general public came to appear dated in the post-war period, as smaller consumer niches started to appear and multiply. In place of the mass survey, another crypto-democratic form of consul consultation came to the fore, namely the focus group. The rise of digital data analytics represents the latest phase in this evolution. Meanwhile, the current neural marketing frontiers of behaviorism make John B. Watson look positively innocent by comparison. What has remained constant, however, is the interplay and tension between behaviorist technique and quasi-democratic forms of consumer voice. The behaviorist does not want to hear what people feel, want, or demand. He wants to discover ways of producing feelings, wants, or demands as objective entities which can be seen. This way, he believes he can eliminate the subject from psychology altogether producing an entirely scientific basis for business practices such as advertising. The problem is that he ends up reliant on his own presupposition about what these feelings mean, drawing on his own experiences and ideals about what rational behavior might look like. No amount of data can explain what happiness or fear means to someone who has never experienced them himself. If the researcher happens to be located in an advertising agency or business school, Terms like choice, desire, emotion, and rationality take on an unavoidably consumerist hue. Behaviorism and the advertising industry are necessarily parasitic on pre-existing spaces and techniques of deliberation, or else they have no way of escaping their own presuppositions or discovering what other people's emotions and desires actually mean. The advertiser who does listen, on the other hand, may be somewhat disturbed by what she hears. She may discover that people want a form of authenticity or community or sheer reality that no product or advert can deliver. The challenge then becomes one of how to package up critical political democratic ideals in ways that can be safely delivered via products or public policies without disrupting the status quo. Elements of anti-capitalist politics which promise an uncommodified, more honest existence have long been a fixture of advertising copy. As far back as the 1930s, advertisements contained images of pre-industrial communal and family life, which seemed to be imperiled by the chaos of the industrial American city. By the 1960s, countercultural imagery was featuring in commercials, even before the counterculture had emerged. Under the influence of market research, political ideals are quietly converted into economic desire. The cold mechanics of marketing and the critique of capitalism are locked into a constant feedback loop, such that there is no remaining idea of what freedom might look like beyond that of consumption. <laughs>
<clears throat> in utilitarian terms, the trick of marketing is to maintain a careful balance between happiness and unhappiness, pleasure and pain. The market must be designed as a space in which desires can be pursued but never fully satisfied, or else the hunger for, for consumption will dwindle. Marketers speak of various emotions today, including liking and happiness, but these positive ones can never be the end of the matter. Anxiety and fear are also important parts of the mix, or else the shopper may find a degree of peace and comfort which requires no further satisfaction. In the 21st century, popular psychologists and neuroscientists are doing a roaring trade as consultants and authors and promising to reveal the truth of how we take decisions, how influence works, and what will deliver the target emotions and moods. The need to ask people what they want tends to diminish somewhat during these upturns in behaviorist excitement, as it did during Watson's day. The Benthamite distrust of language as an indicator of our feelings is manifest in how the neuromarketers claim to bypass what we say we feel directly to the feeling itself. The plausibility of this project is built on various strategic acts of forgetting or not seeing of both history and political possibility. History falls by the wayside or else somebody might notice that the waves of scientific marketing exuberance tend to resemble each other yet never quite deliver on what they originally promised, promised to do, or promised to. <clears throat> the dream of rendering people completely predictable and controllable is always dashed, and that rather, and that rather low-tech alternative form of engagement, dialogue, is reintroduced in some form or other, and politics disappears to that to the extent that. Whenever dialogue does come back in, it does so within safely administered routines and spaces where political desire can appear but not translate into political transformation. The power of human speech is ultimately necessary for consumer culture to be sustained. A science built on the study of white rats combined with clever tools for peering at our eyes and other body parts is not in the final instance adequate for selling products. Less still is it adequate for the management of human beings and workplaces. For this latter purpose, yet another set of techniques, instruments, and measuring devices is required, of which happiness evaluations are the latest installment. <clears throat>